good morning. It's good to see you. Thank you so much, Ann. Let's give Ann another uh, hand. Well, aren't you glad to see the rain? Can't we say that? Instead of snow, aren't you glad to see the rain instead of ice? So we have a blessing today in the rain, right? Hey, I want to uh, just uh, ask you that if you're visiting with us today, a guest with us, if you would uh, find one of these cards in front of you, it's a Connect card, if you'd fill out that information and put it in one of these two containers up here so we can know that you're here today, make contact with you. I promise we won't keep bugging you, but we just want to make contact with you and uh, just let you know we're glad you're here today. A few announcements today that I want to uh, call to your attention. Uh, BCC students, Broadway Christian Church students, which is our junior high and senior high, they'll reopen on March 3rd. And I know the guy who preached last week is going to be extremely grateful for uh, starting back and having uh, in-person meetings with his students. And then uh, that's an open house on March 3rd. Impact starts back the 10th. He'll actually start meeting with the students on March 10th. And then next on that list today, as we've announced, uh, Broadway Kids is open. So you go downstairs, you'll probably see some kids uh, down there. And so we rejoice in that. I know Tula is so grateful for that happening. And I'm sure the parents are grateful that they can come back to church and have some place for their kids to go. So we rejoice in that. I want to let you know on March I can't make out that. That's March 7th, 19th. March 19th, that's 7.30. There's going to be a night of worship, and it's going to be over in the other uh, worship center, the contemporary side, and Jesse, Jesse Bain's going to be leading that and orchestrating that, and so we're just going to get together and just have some uh, time of praise. And so I encourage you to come out to that night of worship on the 19th of March. Then I want to let you also know that we, uh, are, we have a few announcements, but <laughs> hang in there. I want to also let you know that we're going to say goodbye to you version. I think it's about a couple more weeks. I think after March 14th, we will have, uh, you'll be able to do it on your app. You'll be able to uh, pull up the sermon, the notes on your app. And so we're getting rid of you version just to let you know. And then uh, we uh, CR, Celebrate Recovery, will start back up on March 10th. All this will be online. You can see that online. But it'll be from 7 to 8, and it'll be Zoom session uh, as well. And then also we're going to be doing a new way that you can give your money uh, through your, our app, and we'll explain that uh, down the road. But uh, those are the announcements. Uh, again, thank you for being here. It's great to see you, and looking forward to a good day today. And for those of you that are using <coughs> our app, uh, if you want to go to that real quick, somebody had, had asked me last week, would you kind of explain the bottom again? So let me do that real quick uh, because I want you to be able to use this and use it well. So if you could open up your app and at the bottom of your app, well, my, my phone's open up. Hold on. There we go. So once you open the app, at the bottom is home. And then the next thing is messages, and that the messages each week is where uh, the video is to present the next week of reading plan. The next is the Bible, and that is the entire Bible. I think there's five different versions of that that's on there. That's where the 180-day plan is. Next to that, it says Sunday, and above that is a cross. And what uh, we were talking about, about saying goodbye to you version, is for those of you that like to follow along with Craig's notes, go to Sunday. Press Sunday, and it'll come up to a page that looks kind of like this. The announcements are at the top, and then there's a giving page, and then there's a first-time sheet, and then the next thing down is the classic sermon notes. So open the BCC app, scroll, look down at the, just look down at the bottom, you'll see um, it'll have a cross and say Sunday, and then scroll down through there, and you'll see the classic sermon notes, and that's where they are. They're there today as well, so if you want to start using that today, then by uh, March uh, 15th, we'll be done placing all of our sermon notes onto uh, version. So it is going to be a great day. How many of you are glad to be here this morning? We have, for those of you online, oh, there's a few now. I started saying there's only two that raised their hand, but... Uh, we want to welcome you at home as well, and so glad that uh, we have uh, this technology for you to be able to join us too. And uh, we have a wonderful crowd here this morning. And wasn't it nice to get up and go outside your garage, and it feels balmy. Doesn't that feel wonderful? Oh, so love it. I, I enjoy winter, uh, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. And after that, it could go back to 86, as far as I'm concerned. But uh, we've got some new songs, uh, new old songs to sing today in our gospel service. And uh, so we're going to stand. Let's sing, I Shall Not Be Moved. Thank you. 
from our anchor in Christ. The scriptures talk about vain philosophies that are placed out by the world that want to move us away from our faith, that want to move us away from our trust, they want to move us away from those things that anchor us in the Lord and in the scriptures. But there is a time in which we do need to be moved, and that is when we take a step with Jesus in the direction of learning about him more, knowing him more, and moving in the direction of holiness that he desires for every one of us. A step I take, my Savior goes before me. this morning we want to give you an opportunity to go to the Father in prayer. And so I just want to leave this up to you today. Would you bow your head and would you just seek him this morning? Father, thank you for the quietness this morning. We are at times so distracted by the things of this world and sometimes it's difficult to find a place where it's quiet, where just you and, and I can converse. Father, I thank you that you lead us in the way of righteousness. Thank you, Father, for truth. Thank you for love and grace, mercy, honor, righteousness, justice. And Father, these things must and, 
and have already been defined by you in the word of God. And yet, Lord, the world would have us use their definition. And, Father, it certainly is not that which you have put forth. So much of what the world speaks, Father, are half-truths. Words are twisted so that it looks like it's truth. And yet we realize, Father, that there is something in there that is not godly. It is not righteous. And so I pray that you would warn us, Father, through your Holy Spirit to listen intently to what is being said, to weigh it out against the Word of God and against that which you have spoken as truth, that we can walk in the way of righteousness. Thank you, Father. Thank you so, so very much for your words that bring us life, that bring us peace, that bring us living water, that teach us, Lord, that you are the light of the world, that you are the bread of life, that you are salvation to our souls. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for saving us. Thank you for making us whole and complete in you. I ask that as we continue, Lord, that you would bless us today, Father, with your love and with your mercy. In Jesus' name. And amen. Would you take a look at our screens? Take a look at this scripture that uh, reminds us then of that uh, which was going on when Jesus was on the cross. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. Let this Messiah the king of Israel, uh, in the same way the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him. He saved others, they said. He can't even save himself. Let this Messiah, the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross and we will believe. We're going to be talking about that at the end of March as we get ready to go into Easter. What a tumultuous time to be hanging on a cross his body completely torn, ripped, blood oozing from every part of his body. And that blood is that which saves you and me. He, the once for all sacrifice, Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you for your salvation for us. And being that once for all sacrifice because that blood will never, ever, never, ever, lose its power to save us from our sin.
Oh, the blood will never lose its power. It removes our sin, and all of our burdens are lifted at Calvary. Let's continue to sing this morning. Shall we just start over again because it may go better. I'm not sure. I don't know. I, I messed up the first song. I messed up the scripture. Wow. Well, at least I confessed my sin, yes? <laughs> Burdens are lifted at camera. Let me try to read what's on the screen. Shall I do that? That might help. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So I'd like to speak about the new covenant that's mentioned here. In the old covenant, people could approach God only through the priests and the sacrificial system uh, we've been reading about recently. Jesus' death on the cross ushered in the new covenant between God and us. Now all people can personally approach God and talk with him. 
The people of Israel first entered into this agreement after their exodus from Egypt, as we read in Exodus 24, and it pointed to a day when Jesus would come. The new covenant completes the old covenant, fulfilling everything the old covenant looked forward to. Hebrews 10, 11 through 18 says this. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, after offering the same sacrifices again and again, uh, which can never take away sins. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. There he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. For by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. And the Holy Spirit also testifies that this is so. For he says, this is the new covenant I will make with my people that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he says, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. And when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. So let's take this cup of juice and bread and let's remember what Jesus did for us. Let us pray. As your word says, holy, holy, holy are you, Lord God, the Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and is to come. You are worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. You created all things, and they exist because you created what you pleased. Thank you for sending Jesus, so by your grace, through his life, death, and resurrection, we can again have a relationship with you that will last forever. Help us each to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit that always points us to you, and give us the faith and courage to obey as you lead. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for your overwhelming love for us. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Well, good morning, Broadway. It is certainly good to uh, be back with you today. Kathy and I uh, took a little weekend excursion away to Louisville last week and got to eat some of our favorite places over there, worship with the family at Southeast Christian Church, which is always uh, a treat to us to do, but uh, it's, it's good to be back with you today. I, I missed you all. <laughs> I um, wanted to say thanks to Christopher as well. Uh, Christopher, I don't know if you know this or not, but Christopher is 
uh, my nephew uh, through marriage, and so we're just delighted that he is here, him and Abby, and uh, delighted that he's able to speak, and I think he did a wonderful job last week, as well as Mark and the whole team that he has, as well as today. Every week we are blessed to have Mark and the team lead us through, uh, through worship, so uh, I'm grateful. Uh, and then uh, I want to let you know that Christopher will be, uh, you'll be hearing from him again later on in the year. I think it's August. I have him preaching a couple of times this year so you guys uh, can hear from him, uh, and I think that's important. So this series that we're in is called Burning Questions, and today we take a, a turn. For the last three weeks, we've been looking uh, at things basically from our perspective, questions that you and I uh, want to ask, such as, why is there evil and suffering? God, don't you care? And is heaven real, as Christopher talked about last week? So today, for the next three weeks, starting today, uh, our series is going to go a different direction. We're going to take a look at questions from Jesus' end of the spectrum, questions that he wants to ask us, such as, who do you say I am? Do you want to get well? And then, why do you judge? So those are the next three weeks. Those are what we'll be dealing with. Now, questions uh, were important to Jesus. I don't know if you realize that or not. Uh, it, it certainly opened my eyes as I studied for this particular sermon today on how important questions were to Jesus. I found two sources that estimate that Jesus asked somewhere between 307 to 339 questions in the Gospels. Now, that's a lot of questions, isn't it? I mean, if Mark and I wanted to, instead of a six-week series on questions, we could do a six-year series on questions. Now, now relax. We're, we're not going there. Maybe, maybe down the road, we might do another series on other questions. But questions were important to Jesus, and I want you to understand that today. And certainly one that he asked here in Matthew 16, 15 specifically, it has to be at the top of that list. Look with me at Matthew 16, and let's start reading from verse 13. It's on the screen, or you can follow along on your Bible mobile device. It says this, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. So we see from this passage that Jesus asked three specific and direct questions. Who do people say the Son of Man is? What about you? Who do you say I am? And I think I understand why Jesus asked these specific questions at this time. It's the same reason that you and I have asked the questions in our relationships. You want to know where you stand in the relationship. Because questions define the relationship. Point number one, defining the relationship. As I look at these specific questions that Jesus asked here, I see him wanting to know where's this relationship at right now. Define the relationship for me. I see Jesus wanting to know where his disciples are exactly in the relationship with him. Now, think of with me about any serious relationship that you've had in your life. Hasn't there come a point in that relationship where you want to know where the other person stands in that relationship? Whether you're just starting out in a relationship or whether you're getting ready to end a relationship, you want to know where that other person stands. And what's the best way to find out where that other person stands in that relationship? It's to ask questions, isn't it? Do you love me? Do you still love me? Do you believe in me? Do you trust me? Are you with me? Are we on the same page? Are we headed in the same direction? Do we have the same goals? So this is where I see Jesus is at at this point. He's at the height of his ministry, and these 12 guys have been with him every step of the way. These guys have seen him do some incredible things over the course of their time with him. 
They certainly had their ups and their downs. They've had their struggles and their doubts. And they've had their joys and their celebrations. To say that Jesus' disciples were still in a learning curve when it came to truly understanding who Jesus was and everything he did and everything he taught, that would be an understatement, wouldn't it? For example, to need proof of this, just look with me in the previous chapter, chapter 15. Take a look at it later today, but I'm going to talk to you about it today. Jesus was in a discussion with uh, the Pharisees about what defiles a person. And he talked about what it's not really what comes on the outside, it's what's on the inside of what's come out of us. And I want you to look at what the disciples would do to Jesus. And just put yourself in this place. Can you imagine doing this to Jesus? And so basically, they were upset with something that Jesus said. Uh, that, that's kind of strange in, my, in, in and of itself as well. But they were upset with something that he said. And they didn't like the way they said, that he said it to the Pharisees. Look with me what they said. And they called Jesus out on what he said. He says, do you realize, the disciples said, do you realize you offended the Pharisees by what you just said? Basically, they're saying, don't you realize you hurt their feelings? Why did you do that? And Jesus, even more strong with his reply about the state of the Pharisees, he says this, every plant not planted by my heavenly Father will be uprooted, so ignore them. They are blind guides leading the blind. He calls them hypocrites. And bless his heart, poor Peter speaks up. He responds to Jesus' harsh words there and says, basically explain this to us. Explain the parable to us. What are you trying to get us? We don't understand. And don't miss Peter's reply, or Jesus' reply to Peter. And really, it was not just to Peter, it was to the rest of the disciples. Jesus said, are you still so dull? I love the way the message paraphrase says it. Are you still being willfully stupid? <laughs> I mean, think about that. Jesus, do you sense Jesus' frustration here in his reply? He says, guys, are you kidding me? You still don't get it? This is, the, this is that conversation there. Now, keep that thought in mind and go back to chapter 16 or go forward to chapter 16 with me. So do you sense where Jesus might be at this time with these guys? He knows where these guys are some days. He knows these guys just don't get it yet. And no doubt that concerns him. And why would that concern him? Because he knows that his time is soon to, going to be up on this earth. He knows he's soon going to be get ready to dot the I's and cross the T's of his ministry. He knows what awaits him, and it's the cross. And he knows that he's counting on these guys to carry out the Father's plan after he's gone, and that's why he's investing all this time in them. Jesus knows what's at stake here, and there's a lot riding on it if these guys don't get it, if they don't truly understand who he is. And to me, that's why he digs into their lives a little deeper here, and he asks them the question, who do you say I am? Guys, do you really understand who I am? What I'm about? Do you understand what I've been doing the past couple of years with you? Why I've been investing specifically time in you? Do you see the big picture? Do you know who I am? No doubt this question was important to Jesus. And I understand it really wasn't the question that was so much important to Jesus, but what? It was the answer to that question that was important to Jesus. He wanted to know where these guys stood. The importance of this question to me is found that it's listed two other times in the Gospels. Once in Mark chapter 8, 27 through 30, and then in Luke 9, 18 through 20. You can look at that yourself later and compare the two. Details are a little bit different, but it's pretty much the same account overall point is in all this it's listed three different times in the gospel Jesus wanted to know where these guys were in the relationship he's saying can you define me can can you define me the word define means to describe the nature of something or nature of someone to, to describe the basic qualities to describe the scope or the makeup of something or someone to me, as I look at this passage, church, that's where I see Jesus going. That's what I, to me, it's what's on his mind. Do you really know who I am? The scope of me, the magnitude of me. And then it's interesting to me that Jesus waits until he comes to the town of Caesarea Philippi to ask the disciples this specific question. 
And I find it interesting that it's mentioned both in Matthew and Mark that where the disciples are and Jesus are at this time. Matthew says when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, and Mark says Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. So what was it about Caesarea Philippi where Jesus thought this would be a good place to ask this question, who do you say I am? What's the significance? Well, Caesarea Philippi was known for being a city which was dominated by immoral activities and pagan worship. The city stood just 25 miles from the religious communities of Galilee, but the cities uh, were so different in their practices religiously. Caesarea Philippi was, became known as the religious center for worshiping the Greek god Pan, which was the god of nature. On the backdrop of this city was located a huge hill, and located within that hill was a deep cavern or a cave, believed to be the birthplace, the actual birthplace of the god Pan. And to the pagan mind, this cavern and the spring of water that flowed from it uh, literally represented the gate to the underworld. And now that's the type of picture that gives you. I want you to see why Jesus would say what he said later on. Because this picture where he says later on, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Very, very, very real reason why he used this question at this time in Caesarea Philippi. So there's another reason also that Caesarea Philippi, something else that it was known for, also located there was a great temple of white marble built to glorify the godhead of Caesar Augustus. It stood as a symbol of man's power. So here you have in Caesarea Philippi, the disciples are looking out at it, two symbols, two deities staring the disciples straight in the eyes, and I wonder what they were thinking. And you see why it's no accident Jesus would ask his disciples this specific question while there in Caesarea Philippi, looking at what they were looking at. Who do you say I am? But notice, before he asks the disciples the question, he gives them a little test. He wants to see, test them out where they're at. He asks them another question. Who do the people say the Son of Man is? Before he digs into them, he asks them this question on the surface. And again, take into account where they are. And as I just explained, what they're looking at when he asks them this question, who do people say the Son of Man is? Commentator William Barclay makes this interesting observation on this scenario here. It's as if Jesus deliberately sets himself against the background of all the world's religions and all their history and their splendor and demanded to be compared to them and to have the verdict given in his favor. By his question, Jesus seems to want to know, what's, what's the word on the street? What are people saying about me? What, what do they think? Or who do they think I am? And so the disciples answer Jesus because they've heard the word on the street. And I'm sure they've discussed it amongst themselves. It says some say that you're John the Baptist. Others say that you're Elijah. And still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. To see that this wasn't really the question Jesus was concerned about, notice that Jesus doesn't delve any deeper into their response with that question. He just kind of lets it go. Because that's not really what he was concerned about. He wasn't trying to win a popularity poll there within the city. His true concern ran much deeper than that. His true concern was what his disciples, those closest to him, thought about him. And we see that when he asked that second question. But what about you guys? Who do you say I am? Now it seems that Jesus wanted to know that the disciples were siding with the rest of the world. Is he just John the Baptist, risen from the dead? Is he a miracle working prophet like Elijah reincarnated? Or is he one of the other prophets just like Jeremiah? Let me go a little further with this thought. Do you think I'm just a man like the rest of these guys? Do you think I'm just a good guy who will eventually die like the rest of these guys? Or do you see that I'm different? Who do you think I am? It hit me as I uh, thought about this and I put myself in this conversation. When he asked that question, I wonder, we don't know, but I wonder how much time passed from the time he asked the question until Peter replied. Uh, I thought about it. I wonder if there were crickets, you know? You could just hear, you know, silence. Uh, I wonder if everyone looked around at each other and was nodding like, you answer, all right? No, no, you answer, right? 
I, I wonder what was going through the disciples' minds. I wonder if it was an immediate response by Peter or if it was some time in there before he said what he said. And so who of all people breaks the silence? And he really breaks the silence for everybody. Peter stood up, as he would often do, and blurts out, You are the Messiah. Declares, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And I have to believe, when Jesus heard those words from Peter, I have to believe it made him smile, whether it was on the inside or the outside, that he just smiled. I have to believe that he had a sigh of relief when Peter said what he did. Notice Jesus' response by Peter's declaration. He says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. You see, church, Peter's declaration was proof that they were starting to get it. They were starting to understand. Maybe a little slower uh, than Jesus wanted to at times, but they were getting it. Their faith was growing. It, it, was, it wasn't completely there yet, as evidenced by what comes right after our story today. If you look at the very next passage after our passage, look with me at what uh, Jesus says to Peter in that passage. Jesus turned and said to Peter, you remember, let me set up what was happening here. Jesus was explaining to the disciples right after this, what's, what's going to happen? I'm going to go to Jerusalem. Uh, I'm going to be put on trial. I'm going to be nailed to a cross. I'm going to suffer many things. And you remember Peter's response. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Peter said, no, may it never be. And Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You don't have in mind the things of God, but merely human concerns and so I find it very interesting sandwiched in between chapter 15 and this passage right here that I just read Jesus wants to know who they say they that he is and he says get behind me Satan it's a far cry from blessed are you Simon son of Jonah isn't it as you can see these guys still had some issues still had some things to learn along the way about who Jesus really was but they were beginning to discover more of that truth think of how much these disciples had grown from the first time they met Jesus when they first met him he was just a teacher to him right man he taught some amazing things that stood out to them they never heard anybody speak like that uh, but then as they go on they started to understand more about him they started putting the pieces together along the way in Matthew 16 we see them evidently starting to put some of the pieces together because of Peter's declaration now, because of the things they witnessed in their life and experienced in their time with Jesus, they were beginning to understand Jesus more clearly. No longer was he just a good teacher. No longer was he just a good man. No longer was he just a prophet, some prophet who performed miracles. Now they were beginning to see who Jesus really was, that he was the Messiah, the son of the living God. Through all the things they witnessed, God revealed to them who Jesus was through the blind man receiving the sight through the dead walking again through the seas growing calm in the midst of the storm they watched him actually walk on water they were actually there with the 5,000 and the 4,000 plus tasting the bread and the fish and picking up the supplies they had a front row seat for all these things that God revealed to them through Jesus they were eyewitnesses and so those things spoke to them. They were beginning to see Jesus in a different light than they did at the beginning. And they were beginning to believe. They were beginning to believe that he was the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Look how John said it in John 20, verse 31. John said, but these miracles have been written so that you will believe that Jesus is the who? The Messiah, the Son of God. And so that you will have life by believing in him there's no doubt what the father revealed through Jesus made a dramatic difference in how these guys now looked at Jesus it made a difference in why they followed him it made a difference in why they believed him the words Jesus spoke and the things that he did made all the difference for these guys it's why they hung around him after he died it's why they went to the empty tomb it's why they would stand up and preach boldly when before they would flee and run and it's why they would eventually all sacrifice their lives for Jesus. Do you understand today, church, what made the difference for these guys? It came in Peter's words, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. 
And church, do you see why this question, who do you say I am, is so important and was so important to Jesus? It, on it hinges really everything that we believe. So let me ask you a question this morning. If you were there with the disciples, what would you have answered to Jesus' question? Who do you say I am? Just a good man? Jesus is just a good man? Did good things? Man, he had a great teaching. I loved his sermon on that the other day. Just someone that you go to when you need help, like a genie in a bottle. When you're in trouble, you just rub it and out comes and he solves all your issues. Or is Jesus to you the Messiah? Is he the Son of God? Who is Jesus to you today? The answer to that question makes all the difference in how you live and how I live my life. Makes all the difference in what, what you do with your life. Makes all the difference in how you look at others, how you love others, in what you say to others. Makes all the difference in what you're willing to give up in life, how you spend your time, how you spend your money. Jesus wants to define the relationship with you today. He wants to know, who do you say I am? And can you honestly answer him that he is the Messiah, the anointed one, the son of the living God, the one who gives you life? Because Jesus says, if I am the Messiah and the son of the living God, if I am the one who has cleansed you from your sin, has wiped your slate clean, if I am the one who has changed you completely, the one who's given you new life, the one who has all authority to loose and to bind the powers of this world, if I am that one, then show me. Show me. Prove it by the way that you live your life. Two scriptures, church, that I want to leave you with today. Two scriptures that kind of will define the relationship for you. You will see yourself in this, I hope. Galatians 2.20, Paul says this, I have been crucified with Christ. I have died with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And then Paul, Philippians 4, 7, and 8, says this, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. Church, is Jesus the Messiah? And is he the son of the living God to you? Answer those questions today to him. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you so much for this passage. I thank you for the significance of this passage to Jesus and to the disciples and to us. Father, he asked us the same thing today as he asked the disciples. Who do you say I am? Father, over the years of our life... I'm almost 58 years old. I know, I know you in different ways along those years, certainly to when I first started out to where I am now. And I know I speak to people who understand what I'm talking about. What the Father has revealed to us, has it helped us to know you, Jesus, truly as the Son of the living God? And does our life reflect it? I pray that you would grow our faith. God, we are, I put myself in the picture with the disciples there of not understanding things, of getting things wrong, mis, misspeaking, misunderstanding. But God, I do know you better. And I'm, I'm, I'm just willing. I've got an open heart to, to keep learning, to keep growing, to keep understanding more of who you are. And so help us, God. Help us in our lives as we live this daily life that we would look to you, the one who gives us life, the one who has wiped our slate clean. Help that to make all the difference in our lives as we live in this world. May you be glorified, Father, in what we do. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand right now. If you have a decision upon your heart, uh, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we would love for you to uh, to be introduced to him today. He's calling for you. He's drawing you. That's why you're here today. He knew you would be here today. And he knew you'd hear a specific message today. So we ask you to come. We, if you, you want to join this church family, be a part of this church family officially. We would love for you to come as well. If you just have a prayer need, 
and you need some prayer today, won't you come as we sing this song? Well, it's good to uh, see you today. Good to have you join us uh, from home. I want to remind you that there are three ways that you can give. Uh, you can send in your, uh, the, your donations, uh, offerings that through the mail. You can go online, and you can go to the new app here soon to, to give. And so we're excited about that. Thank you again so much for giving. Uh, let me ask you this. How's it going with your 180-day reading plan? All right, are you having fun? Man, isn't there some interesting stuff in the Old Testament? And Leviticus, a little repetitive, but it's some interesting stuff in there. Let me encourage you to keep going. Uh, I don't know how far we are in this, Mark, as far as how many days. I think we're in four weeks. Five, week five. All right, week five. And I hope you're enjoying the videos that the staff are putting forth, taking the time to do that to encourage you to look for certain things as you go through there. So love you. Have a great week.